Hello everyone and welcome to the lecture on federalism for POL 102. Uh, to start out with federalism, this is a term that we mentioned in the last lecture several times. Just to recap what it is, uh, it's a form of government, one that shares power between different levels. Uh, when we're talking about the United States context, we'll be talking about a national government and then the various state governments below that. The key, the key point here is that, uh, first of all, the sovereignty of the various states is guaranteed, uh, and their existence is guaranteed. So the federal government does not have the authority uh, to take away the right of states to rule uh, in their uh, reserved policy domains in their in their territory. They don't have the ability to dissolve the states, uh, and the states are generally going to have certain uh, policy domains where they have power uh, that the, the federal government can't encroach upon. To summarize where these various areas are, uh, they've evolved over time. This is a good chart that sort of depicts the current state of federalism in the country. Uh, the Venn diagram has on the left bubble powers held by the national government exclusively, on the right side powers held by the state government exclusively, and then in the middle uh, powers that are shared, uh, in other words things that both the state government and the national government do. Uh, the shared uh, part of the bubbles is, as you see, uh, the, has the largest entries both states and the national government do things like taxing, spending, borrowing, uh, and cover a, a wide variety of specific policy areas. Uh, the national government has uh, exclusive power over things like coining money, you know, the, uh, making the currency in the country, uh, prosecuting war, uh, conducting foreign policy, uh, maintaining an armed forces, regulating commerce between the states, uh, where states, as we'll talk about uh, as we go through the lecture, uh, as time has gone on, gone on through uh, the history of our country, the areas of exclusive coverage uh, for the states have sort of reduced in nature. Uh, at this point, uh, some notable examples are criminal law. Most of uh, the criminal law in the country is handled at the state level. Obviously, there are federal offenses and federal law enforcement uh, entities like the FBI. Uh, we have a federal judiciary, but you know most most crimes. Uh, are being prosecuted at the state level rather than the federal level. Uh, family law is another domain where states have most of the say, uh, and anything that could be you know, demonstrated as really strictly intrastate commerce, in other words, commerce within the state, uh, in theory, that's left to the states to control. Although, as we'll discuss in our uh, uh, when we get into the commerce clause, uh, this is kind of uh, a very very narrow. Uh, range of policies at this point. Uh, there's not really much that, uh, in terms of commerce, that the federal government doesn't have the ability to, to regulate at this point under the Commerce Clause, given the way it's been interpreted. All right, uh, to get into uh, the main body of our talk today, uh, we're going to be covering three different areas. Uh, first of all, we'll get back to talking about the Constitution, how it uh, establishes the framework for federalism, uh, we'll talk about then uh, sort of a, a historical look at how federalism has evolved in the United States over the centuries since the Constitution was ratified uh, and, and some really key clauses in the Constitution uh, that have been interpreted and reinterpreted to, to inform the state of federalism today uh, as it operates in the country. And finally, we'll have a, an, inter an interesting discussion about how state governments themselves differ uh, from the way the federal government operates. We don't really have any, any week to talk exclusively about how, uh, like for instance, the state of New York, how their government runs or how any other state government runs. For the most part, they're structured similar, similarly to the federal government. So, you know, this is just a good time when we're on the topic of federalism and the relationship between state and federal governments to point out some key differences between the way state governments operate and how the federal government operates. So we'll close out with that discussion. All right, to begin, let's get back to talking about the Constitution, this time with specific, uh, specific aim on what it says regarding federalism and the structure of uh, the new government. All right, so you could recall that one of the we, we talked about in the last lecture, one of the key uh, areas of thought and, and debate was how the new arrangement of power within uh, the government under the new constitution uh, was going to, to either promote or advance certain types of policies. Uh, specifically, uh, the founders did not want 
policies to be advanced that would encroach on people's liberties. So they were looking for a form of government that was going to be most likely to prevent this from happening. Let's talk about what the options were now, you know, back then. Uh, if you're someone in the, at the Philadelphia Convention, what were the, the possible ways that you could arrange government uh, in order to, to pursue this goal of, uh, of not having liberty to be encroached upon? So back then, at that point in history, there were two main forms of government, you know, really broadly speaking, in terms of the arrangement between uh, the national government and any lower uh, levels of government. So first of all, confederal system of government. Uh, this would have been where the subnational units have most of the power. Uh, for instance, before the Constitution was ratified, uh, the Articles of Confederation had a, a confederal form of government. Uh, this would have been uh, a form where the states, you know, like, like I said, hold most of the power, and the national government doesn't really have much of a uh, much of a way to impose its will uh, on the lower levels of the government. So this is something, uh, a form that maybe isn't as frequent. Uh, these days in the, in the last few centuries, but during that period of time uh, was somewhat common. On the opposite end of the spectrum, a unitary government is one in which the national government uh, holds dominion basically over all the subnational units. So the, the, uh, the national government has the ability to say what powers uh, the, the subnational units have. They have the power to dissolve the governments, uh, change their, their uh, territorial dominion, things like this. Uh, in neither of these options, either confederal uh, or unitary, were looked upon that favorably from people in the, the convention trying to discuss how we could form uh, this new government under a new constitution. So, you know, we didn't want a confederal system uh, by itself because that's what we had or already had under the Articles of Confederation. It didn't really work out that well. It didn't really uh, provide for a really effective national government. It wasn't able to to discharge a lot of the duties that are necessary uh, for a functional government to, uh, to do. We didn't want, on the other hand, a unitary system, which you know, would have made it easier to, to, for the government to start encroaching on liberty at some point if, it, if the wrong person came to power, basically, just because so much of the, the power in a unitary government is concentrated at the national level. So n neither of the, the main options, the most frequent options back during uh, the, late eight, uh, the late 18th century were really that appealing. So what happens is basically the, they create a new system uh, at the Constitutional Convention, a federal system in which it's basically a go-between between, between a, a unitary and a confederal system where power is distrib distributed across both the national government and the subnational governments, i.e. the states. So under the new constitution, uh, the federal government has certain powers, states have certain other powers, uh, and the federal government is not able to, to really dissolve or substantially uh, eliminate some of the powers that the states hold. You know, the, the, the existence of the states is basically guaranteed and their sovereignty is guaranteed under this new system called federalism. Uh, just to sum up the discussion so far, this is a, a handy graph if you need it. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about it. We've pretty much already covered these points. Uh, confederal systems, power flows from subnational units to the national government. Uh, in a unitary system, the national government uh, vests some power into subnational units, uh, but ultimately maintains pretty much full control over them. Uh, in a federal system, you have sovereignty you know, in both directions and powers that are uh, interacting between both levels. Uh, well, the new constitution, you know, we'll talk uh, here and then in, the, in the, the near future about some of the ways in which federalism uh, is outlined in the constitution. One of the important ones is the Tenth Amendment. Uh, so back during this time, uh, the national government, you know, the, the founders wanted more power, uh, a, a better ability for it to do its things that it needed to do than was found in the Articles of Confederation. But altogether, uh, they still envisioned a pretty limited government, uh, maybe relative to what uh, we think of what the government does these days. Uh, the Tenth Amendment uh, is maybe the, the largest source of state power in the new constitution, and that anything that the federal government isn't responsible for under the new constitution, which back then was uh, quite a bit, is left to the states to do. So this is called the reserved powers. Article 1, Section 8 uh, outlines uh, what Congress is allowed to do, the National Congress. These are called the enumerated powers, things that aren't specifically laid out in, in the Constitution for the federal government to do are reserved to the states in the Tenth Amendment. Uh, 
We've talked about uh, a few of these other uh, clauses in the, the last lecture on the Constitution, the full faith and credit clause uh, outlining, you know, the, uh, the sort of the certifications, licenses, documents, things like this in, in one state have to be recognized by other states, equal privileges and immunities, saying that you know, states can't discriminate against people, uh, excuse me, from other states. Uh, and finally, you know, uh, even though a substantial amount of power is left to the states uh, in the new constitution, it's also dictated that when you know, there are instances where the national and the state level laws may conflict, the, the national law is supreme over the state level law. And, and we'll get into some example, or one specific example of where this has happened in modern days and how it's resolved. Um, but just note that the, the, where there's conflict, the national level law is supreme. Uh, so back then, you know, there, we, we talked last lecture about the debates between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists and that this new draft of the Constitution uh, wasn't really uniformly uh, welcomed. You had the Anti-Federalists who didn't like it. Uh, and the same can be said for this new system of government, federalism uh, versus some other form of government. Uh, not everyone was really convinced that the that federalism would guarantee, as it was supposed to, uh, that there would be no encroachment on liberties. Uh, back during that time, uh, you can characterize the argument as either people adhering to compact theory or nationalist theory. Uh, those who were in favor of sort of trying to to stay with a, a more state-centered government, maybe not give the federal government as much power as the new constitution does, uh, they would have adhered to contract theory, where uh, they their perspective is that, yeah, we're forming this new government that it's going to have more powers, but ultimately the source of power within the United States is the states themselves. So when there, you know, if there's ever broad conflict where the the power of the, the federal government gets out of line compared to what maybe it's supposed to be in the Constitution, the states still have the rights to try to rein it in because ultimately they're, you know, that's where the, the ultimate sovereignty lies in the country is with the states. Uh, this is a view that was more uh, more prevalent in the South. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is uh, one of the major adherents. On the other hand, you had people uh, who were more favorable toward this new federal system and the power given to the federal government. Uh, these have been people uh, adhering to what's called nationalist theory, or if you ever heard the term contract theory as opposed to compact theory. Contract theory saying that uh, basically when the states enter into this new government, they're giving up some degree of their sovereignty. You know, it's, it's essentially a contract that they're signing into one with one another, uh, vesting this power into the federal government, and that's power that they're not able to give back. You know, they're giving... They're giving it these powers so that it can govern more effectively and ultimately uh, do better for the land that it's governing. Uh, and it's not really an option at that point to, to sort of take it back if the states decide that they don't like the arrangement after the fact. And of course, this is a dominant viewpoint uh, in the northern states as opposed to the southern states uh, who were more in favor of compact theory. Okay, so we've talked about now some of the, the background as far as the Constitution and uh, historical thought during the time period uh, relating to federalism. Let's talk about now how, uh, the, how federalism is actually practiced in the country and how it evolves over time. Uh, and we can really divide things between uh, early periods in the nation's history, uh, which are characterized by a system of dual federalism, and then getting into more recent times, uh, where it evolves into a system of cooperative federalism. So let's talk about what these two terms actually mean. Uh, so dual federalism, uh, up until about the 1930s, is the dominant, uh, the dominant paradigm through which the states interact with the federal government. Basically, this just means that uh, the states have distinct areas of policy, influence, and power, and the federal government has distinct areas of, of policy, influence, and power. So if you think back to that Venn diagram that I showed you right at the beginning, there would have been a lot more uh, a lot more entries in the exclusivity bubbles and not as many entries in the one in the middle with shared powers. So uh, just more more exclusive areas of policy dominance uh, for the states and the national government. Uh, for example, you know, back during the time when dual federalism uh, was the paradigm, things like uh, public safety, policing powers, uh, public welfare, uh, 
enforcement of morality would have been all things that the federal government government wasn't really that involved in. It was all left to the states. Uh, on the other hand, uh, defense policy, trade policy, uh, monetary policy, uh, in other words, the, the coin of currency, these are all examples of where, you know, back then, uh, the federal government has a, a really cl clearly defined a distinct area of policy influence apart from the states. As we go forward in time, though, uh, the general direction of things is that uh, policy areas that were once uh, exclusive to the states start getting um, start seeing more involvement from the federal government as we go uh, go forward. Most notably in the 1930s, uh, those of you who are familiar with American history uh, will note that this is a time uh, when we saw the Great Depression. Uh, there was both uh, acute uh, and uh, really extended periods of malaise in this time. Uh, and with it, you see uh, public sentiment start to change as far as what the United, what the United States government, the national government, in other words, should be doing uh, in times of crisis to try to alleviate the problems. Beforehand, uh, it wasn't really viewed as the, the federal government's job to come in when there's a, an economic problem uh, and try to fix it. Starting with the Great Depression, though, uh, and the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt, going forward, whenever there's a crisis, uh, people start to think, you know, it's the federal government's job to come in and do what they can to, to end it, to make things better. In order for this to happen, though, uh, the, gov the federal government has to start acting uh, within policy domains that were previously left to the states. So, you know, whereas economic policy, this is the, uh, the main area we're talking about, at least in terms of the, the Great Depression, a lot of these things, you know, the regulatory powers would have been left to the states to decide what, what's going on. Uh, the federal government starts to intervene more into those uh, areas. Uh, one way that the book uh, tries to distinguish these two types of federalism, uh, dual versus cooperative, is using uh, the cake metaphor, a marble cake versus a layer cake. Uh, here you have a layer cake, which roughly corresponds, you know, if, if food metaphors are your thing, to dual federalism. Uh, you see, you know, the point here being that the layers are all distinct from one another, so you could think of the chocolate layer as a federal domain, uh, or in the, the icing a state-level domain. They're, they stick to themselves, uh, not really crossing into each other's areas that much. On the other hand, Moving forward, uh, the book corresponds cooperative federalism more to a, a marble cake where the different flavors are intermingled, uh, so there's not that much distinguishing. Uh, you can't slice off a, a particular part of this cake and only have one one flavor or the other. Uh, basically, all of the different policy areas uh, have both state and federal influence uh, under this paradigm of cooperative federalism. One good example to illustrate how federal law interacts with state law uh, in the operation of the Supremacy Clause is minimum wage. So currently, the federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. The first attempt by the government to institute a minimum wage, uh, as it happens, was back in the 1930s. So this was the era we just discussed uh, when uh, the federal government was starting to intervene more in the economy uh, and go into areas of policy that would have previously been left to the states. So starting in the 1930s, uh, the, they began trying to establish a minimum wage. Uh, this chart here uh, illustrates the current state of minimum wage throughout the country in the, in the various states. So like I said, the, the federal rate right now is 725. Uh, you'll notice that you have some states here shaded in green. This indicating that these are states that have laws on the, the books that make the minimum wage greater than the federal level. So when this is the case, uh, states are allowed to do this. So the, the minimum wage law at the federal level is basically a floor established that uh, the wage cannot go lower than 725. Uh, states are free to, to pass laws that, are, you know, that, that establish a minimum wage at a higher level. Uh, but for instance, when you look here uh, at states that are shaded in gray, there are only a few at this point, uh, Georgia and Wyoming. These would be states that have laws on the books where uh, minimum wage is lower than the 725 federal level, uh, the federal level supersedes their laws. So you know, in these two states, uh, I would imagine the, the minimum wage laws here are probably just older laws that were passed prior to the minimum wage at the federal level going up to 725 that are just uh, still on the books and they haven't passed a new law since then. But when this is the case, because of the Sup Supremacy Clause, uh, the 725 federal level uh, 
it supersedes the state law, uh, and the wage in these states is made 725. Uh, and those are really the two key categories to point out. You see uh, these states in the light blue uh, have the same statutory minimum wage rate as the federal government. Uh, and a few states have passed no minimum wage laws. And in these cases, of course, where there's no state state uh, minimum wage, uh, the minimum wage in those states is also the 725 federal level. Let's talk now about how the interpretation of the Constitution uh, specifically with regard to a few uh, really important passages that change over time and how you know, what effect this has had on the nature of federalism in the country. You can think back to the last lecture toward the end we talked about how uh, judicial review uh, it doesn't affect how you know the specific wording of the Constitution doesn't change the language but it has practical effects on how it's applied and this could be you know, just as important as uh, actual amendments that do add text to the document. Uh, one way that judicial review has really influenced federalism is through the implied powers. Uh, so recall, uh, uh, to this lecture, to, toward the beginning, I talked about uh, the enumerated powers, which are you know, in Article 1, uh, Section 8, that lists specific powers that the, the Congress and the national level was allowed to do. Uh, during the early period of our country, after ratification of the Constitution, uh, there's sort of a narrow approach uh, to the enumerated powers. So you know, the federal government was allowed to do these things, but people were kind of uncomfortable whenever it would, would uh, try to stretch the boundaries uh, of the enumerated powers and go into things that were you know, more ambiguous and not explicitly stated there uh, in Article 1, Section 8. One, one case that uh, begins to open up, begins to open up the, the interpretation uh, of the powers of the federal government uh, is McCullough versus Maryland. And this is a case where uh, the, the federal government has established a federal bank, the, the second federal bank actually, bank, uh, uh, and it has branches in Maryland, uh, and Maryland starts trying to tax the federal bank. Uh, and a few, a few important things come into play uh, during this case. Uh, most notably of which was whether or not the federal government actually had the authority to create a bank. Uh, if it didn't, then obviously you know, the, this you know, it would have been disallowed. Uh, so the the key here is even though the enumerated powers do not include any specific wording that says the federal government has the right to create its own bank. Uh, the Supreme Court looks at what comes you know, after uh, all the enumerated powers, and the, the clause immediately following them is that Congress also has the right uh, to execute laws that are necessary and proper to fulfilling these you know, foregoing powers that are listed in the enumerated powers. And this is uh, what's known as the necessary and proper clause. Very important one uh, to know about. And given that in the enumerated powers there are things like, you know, taxing and spending, coinage of money. The Supreme Court says that uh, the establishment of a bank uh, can be construed as both, both necessary and proper to these other actually enumerated powers that are written down specifically. Uh, and in that sense, the court allows the federal government to have its bank. Uh, in general, this precedent going forward really opens up uh, the purview of, of policies that the federal government is allowed to enact uh, under the implied powers, so it's not, it's no longer really restricted to uh, a pretty narrow view of things that it can do that are specifically listed in Article 1, Section 8. It can also start doing things uh, that are just, you know, implied uh, and can be argued are necessary or proper to the things that are listed in the Constitution. Another clause that we've mentioned before that has a pretty uh, important impact on federalism uh, as we progress through the history of the nation is the Commerce Clause. This is another clause where uh, if you look at the early periods of the country uh, shortly after ratification, uh, it was pretty narrowly interpreted. So uh, the federal government had the ability to restrict states from doing things like taxing one another or restricting travel between one another, uh, but you know it wouldn't have uh, asserted the ability to to, re to, to regulate the economy within states, for example. So the things that the federal government was doing uh, were kind of, you know, really narrowly tailored and not really uh, 
not really that broad, not, not affecting too much of what we might think of the government as doing in the economy these days. Uh, a lot of the impetus behind that changing is the changing interpretation of the Commerce Clause. So it says uh, that the federal government has the sole uh, authority on regulating interstate commerce going forward, you know, again, starting with the 1930s, uh, as the changing goals of the federal government in terms of uh, acting within the national economy and directing it, as those change, uh, so too does the interpretation of the Commerce Clause. So one important case uh, it's national you know, NLRB versus Laughlin Steel. This is a, a case where uh, basically the court holds that anything that, uh, any goods or services that are being traded across states, so even, you know, uh, if they're made solely in a state and then they're just traded across state lines, that constitutes interstate commerce uh, and, the, and the national government can regulate uh, parts of the economy uh, that satisfy these criterion just by virtue of. Um, having inputs or having sales across states. And here's another really important Commerce Clause case, one which we discussed in the last lecture, Wickard v. Filburn. Uh, to give you the background on this, this is a, a farmer, uh, Filburn from Ohio. Uh, he was growing wheat on his farm uh, for the purposes of feeding his livestock. Uh, so this, these were crops that uh, weren't uh, being, they weren't coming from out of state, they weren't being sold out of state, they weren't being sold at all. Uh, however, during this time period, uh, the federal government was introducing crop quotas, basically. So one of the problems uh, during the Great Depression, the recovery from the Great Depression, uh, was the fact that farmers weren't planting enough. So you know, they weren't able to, to sell them for very much money on the open market. Uh, just because demand was so low, uh, people didn't have a lot of income. And one way that the federal government was trying to get uh, crop prices back up so that people would actually have incentive to grow the crops uh, was to restrict how much, uh, you know, how much people could grow, basically. Uh, Filburn comes into conflict with these restrictions, uh, and he brings to court with the argument that the federal government doesn't actually have any right to regulate or restrict what he's growing on his own farm uh, for crops that aren't entering into any sort of uh, open market. You know, the, the federal government has the right to regulate interstate commerce, but his argument is basically that what he's doing doesn't constitute interstate commerce. Uh, the, the, the court holding, though, here is that if he had not been planting his own crops, he would have been forced to purchase them on the open market, which, uh, in effect, would have affected interstate commerce to some degree. Uh, so the court rules that the federal government can regulate this sort of thing, uh, even if it's not, you know, if it's not obviously uh, affecting interstate commerce directly. Maybe it still is indirectly. And what that gets us is basically, basically that uh, since then, uh, the approach to interstate commerce has been quite broad at, in the courts. Uh, the federal government has a pretty, uh, pretty wide latitude to do what it wants in the economy when it thinks uh, there are laws that it can make to improve uh, what's going on in the economy or uh, regulations that'll help either people or, or commerce. What do they want to do? Uh, the federal government has a pretty uh, uh, a pretty high degree of authority to, to do whatever it, it, it deems appropriate these days, uh, in part because of uh, the Supreme Court interpretation of the Commerce Clause. Uh, finally, the last thing to note uh, the last thing that we're going to note in terms of the relationship between the federal government and the states is that the federal government's fiscal policies can also be highly influential on the states. Uh, so there are, broadly speaking, a couple of different ways that the federal government uh, can direct states to do things. So first, it can pass a mandate. Uh, so this would just be the, pre the, the, the federal government saying uh, to the states, you have to do this. Another way that the uh, federal government can force, or not force, but influence the states to do things is by using money. So the states need money. The federal government uh, has a lot of money that it uh, has the ability to disperse between the states. It can use this in pursuit of policy goals that it wants the states to fulfill. This can come in the form of categorical grants where the money uh, is, sp is specifically set aside for the states to spend uh, on a specific policy goal. Uh, or block grants, where the federal government uh, sort of just gives money to the states, and the states have a, a high degree of discretion as far as what they spend it on. 
The, the really classic example uh, in recent times of the effect of fiscal federalism uh, is the drinking age. So if you're wondering why it's 21, there's not actually a federal law that requires the drinking age to be 21, but back in the 1980s, uh, 1986, the federal gov government passed a law that said that uh, we want, you know, basically, we, we want the states to pass uh, state-level laws that make the drinking age 21 or older. Uh, and if states, you know, any state that does not pass any pass these statutes, statutes raising it to 21, they're going to be penalized uh, by highway funds. So the federal government provides funds to the states to build and maintain highways. Uh, for those states that refuse to raise the drinking age to 21, the federal government was going to uh, to reduce their highway funds by I think 10 percent. This is a, a substantial degree of money uh, for a lot of different states. So uh, as a result of this, you basically see the uniform uh, statutory uh, drinking age raise to 21 uh, pretty much throughout every state. Okay, uh, and the final thing that we're going to close out with uh, this lecture is talking specifically about state governments uh, in terms of how they differ from the federal government. Like I said, we don't have a, uh, a lecture dedicated to talking about uh, state government specifically, but it's worth at this point pointing out uh, how state governments differ from the federal government. Uh, we're going to be talking uh, as we go on uh, in a, a high degree of detail regarding the federal executive, the federal legislature, uh, and the federal judiciary. Uh, and most states are structured relatively similar. You know, all the states have executive branches, legislatures, and judicial branches, uh, though the structure and comp composition of them uh, varies a bit from state to state. One noteworthy thing in terms of uh, state executive branches, in other words, the governor uh, of each state, uh, most of them have line item vetoes. Uh, looking forward to uh, our discussion of the presidency, the president you know, has the authority to veto legislative items that are passed by Congress that he doesn't like. Uh, however, the president can only say, uh, I want to pass this in full or I want to veto it in full. Now, the states, however, a lot of the governors have the authority uh, to just pass. Uh, most of the bill, but only veto specific aspects of it that they don't like. Uh, this is called the line item veto. Uh, this is one of the, the major distinguishing um, items between uh, governors and their powers as opposed to uh, the president. And the legislative branch, again, uh, they're composed pretty similarly uh, to Congress at the federal level. Uh, almost every state has a bicameral system uh, with an upper house and a lower house, just like the federal government. The one exception being Nebraska, which has a unicameral, uh, nonpartisan legislature. You know, if you're you ever get that question in, if on trivia night, there it is. Nebraska, the one uh, unicameral legislature in the country. As far as the judicial branch goes, um, again, there's a degree of similarity between uh, state judiciaries and the federal judiciary. They they have a, a hierarchical hierarchical structure where uh, your cases are generally going to start at one level, and you have levels of appeals. And ultimately, there's a Supreme Court at both the state and uh, the federal level. However, the way that judges are selected at the state, at the state level uh, are substantially different uh, than what's going on at the federal level. At the federal level, all the, the federal judges are appointed by the, uh, the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. At the state level, uh, different states have different selection criteria. Uh, first of all, you know, we'll get into these in a second. Uh, but let's look at the, the executive branches and some of the, the features uh, throughout the different states in the country. Most of them, uh, you'll see on this chart, uh, the term limit structure uh, is similar to that for the president. You know, the president, as we know, uh, can, serve two, can, can serve two terms total. They can be consecutive or non-consecutive, uh, four years for each term. Most of the states uh, are arranged similar to that, so any of the states... Uh, that are unshaded you know, in white would be those that adhere to that structure. Uh, some states have unlimited terms, so a governor uh, in these states can serve as long as he or she wishes to. Uh, uh, the, the states that have line item vetoes, as we just discussed, uh, would be most of these. The ones that do not would be uh, the light green states. So you see most of them do have line item veto. Uh, we talked about the judiciary. Uh, at the state level, and again, the the most noteworthy aspect is the selection mechanisms. Uh, this map is de depicting them. Uh, many of the states have what's known as the the merit selection system, uh, or as identified on this slide, the Missouri plan. Uh, under this system, the state judges are uh, basically selected on a, a kind of a three part process. The first part being uh, 
There's a nonpartisan panel uh, composed of lawyers and judges who select a list of uh, potential candidates for any sort of judgeship opening. This list is then given to the governor, who picks one single candidate off this list, who then goes into power. Uh, the key part being, though, afterward, at the next election, the people get a chance to either approve or disapprove of the governor's selection. So if the governor selects somebody that the people don't like, they can vote them out of office at the next election, uh, and then the process basically starts again at the beginning. The governor has to, to reappoint someone. Other states, interestingly, though, uh, have direct election for governors. So uh, the states uh, in dark blue have partisan elections, in which case there's a, a Democrat and a Republican on the ticket, and whatever other parties there are. Uh, in light blue, you have nonpartisan elections, where it's, uh, the people still get to decide, but there's no explicit partisan listing on the ballot. Uh, and this is obviously a, a big distinction from the federal level. The people don't get uh, any direct say at the federal level as far as uh, who takes the, the federal judiciary slots. Judges are appointed by the president, uh, and they serve life terms. So uh, there's, no, there's no direct say for the people there. In terms of direct democracy, there's also uh, some avenues for uh, legislation and uh, uh, and other ways to control uh, the people that are actually comprising government that aren't available at the federal level that several states have. So uh, in various states, you have referendum and initiative. Referendum being a method whereby if there's a measure that passes through the state legislature, instead of sending it to the governor uh, for approval, the legislature can send it instead to the people to vote on it directly at the next election. Uh, so this would be a potential strategy if there's a law that the legislature wants to pass that they don't think the governor is necessarily going to support, but maybe they think they can get a majority of the people to support it. Uh, so they can send it to the people rather than the governor. In a similar process, initiative, uh, uh, the difference here between initiative and referendum is how the process begins. Initiative is usually something that started at the citizen level, where if there's a group of concerned citizens and they want some piece of legislation or a policy passed, they can uh, write it down, gather uh, however many number of signatures are required uh, by law, and then put it on a ballot that way. So initiative doesn't actually require any action by the government at all. A referendum requires uh, the process be started in the legislative branch and then the people vote on it. Initiative uh, begins with the people collecting signatures usually, uh, then the people voting on it if there are enough signatures. So these are two basically uh, ways of legislating uh, that uh, to varying degrees and involve you know involve the people to to a greater extent uh, than the normal legislative processes would. Uh, you can see here on this map uh, the shaded states, uh, either in uh, orange or blue. Uh, orange are states that have both initiative and recall. Uh, blue have initiative only. Uh, green actually have referendum only, and then there are several states that don't have. Uh, uh, that have neither of these options. So, you know, again, a pretty high degree of variance uh, in what's available in the state as far as direct democracy goes. Uh, another method that people have at the states to influence the direction of government that isn't available at the federal level uh, is what's known as recall. So this is a tool where uh, if there's a, an elected official, in, a state-level elected official, uh, you know, there's like a governor, a state senator, state congressman, uh, if they're really unpopular or have done something uh, that's really upset the people, they can initiate a process to try to remove him or her from office. Uh, and the way this is usually going to going to operate is it starts out with uh, there's a requisite number of signatures that's uh, outlined by law to start to start the process off, and then if uh, the people that are concerned gather enough signatures of people that want to have a recall election, the state will be forced to call an election specifically for the purposes of determining whether to keep or throw out of office this person uh, who, uh, you know, who uh, who is the subject of the recall. You can see, getting back to this map, uh, there are states with asterisks here. Uh, those are the ones with recall. Uh, many of them have it, you know, many of them don't have it. To give you some prominent examples of how recalls uh, have operated in practice in recent times, uh, here's a, a slide where uh, all of you probably recognize at least one of the people on the slide. You know, on the right is obviously Arnold Schwarzenegger. On the left, if you're not uh, familiar with this person, this is Gray Davis, who was the governor in California uh, before Arnold Schwarzenegger takes office. Uh, and uh, as, it, as it turned out, Gray Davis uh, 
uh, was a governor who was recalled. Uh, Arnold didn't win the governorship during a normal election year. He won it as a result of the culmination of a recall process against Gray Davis. Uh, during this time, uh, California was having a number of issues, most notably with energy. So they had shortage of it, shortages of energy, such that uh, parts of the, the state uh, had rolling blackouts. There wasn't enough power to go around. Uh, there were other issues in the state. Uh, and, and so Gray Davis becomes a really unpopular governor. Uh, and the way the recall works is that uh, first uh, a number of signatures had to be gathered of people who were disaffected with Davis who wanted him removed. Uh, in California, I believe it was about 1.3 million signatures uh, that were collected to start the recall effort. Uh, so a pretty, uh, a pretty large uh, amount of work goes into that, right? Going to getting 1.3 million people to sign uh, a petition. So there's a pretty big uh, barrier at the forefront there. What happens at this point, uh, given that they reached the limit of signatures that they need, uh, the state then initiated a recall election. Uh, and this is the ballot. If you were voting uh, on October the 7th, 2003 in the recall election, this is what you would have seen. Uh, and this is an interesting process to look at. Uh, first of all, you see they were asked to vote should Gray Davis uh, be removed or not. So you have, first of all, a yes or no question. If you like Gray Davis and you don't want to be recalled, you can select no. If you do want it to be recalled, you say yes. Uh, and so the first thing that gets tallied is all the yeses and nos. Uh, if the yeses win, you know, we want them recalled. Uh, then you go down to what happens uh, uh, down here in the next section. As it, as it turns out, a majority did say yes, they want Gray Davis recalled. Uh, and the next section deals with uh, who do you want to select to replace him. Uh, here you can see uh, there are a, a whole lot of candidates on the ballot for this recall election. Uh, over 130, I believe. You know, the list actually goes down here. There's only about half of them. Uh, there are a lot more farther down. So this was a, a recall process where the uh, the threshold of being put on the ballot was actually quite low. I think it was just a, a fee you had to pay, which was in like the low thousands of dollars or something. So you got hundreds of people uh, just for the heck of it throwing their names on the ballot here uh, during the California recall election. Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, relatively high up on the ballot. Uh, he, of course, eventually wins uh, the recall election to become the new governor. Uh, and I'd say the last thing to point out on this slide is there's also uh, another, ex a few examples of direct democracy going on, on the right side of the ballot here. Uh, there are a few uh, referendums for the people to vote on, uh, things that were passed by the California Assembly uh, and then put on this ballot to either be voted for approval or, or rejection by the people. Uh, one other recent uh, gubernatorial example of recall uh, involves these two guys here. Uh, again, maybe you recognize one of the people on this uh, on this slide. This is Scott Walker, uh, who uh, in the early phases of the Republican dominating cycle uh, back in 2015 was a candidate. Uh, he didn't last too long. Once Trump entered the, entered the race, he started uh, taking away a lot of his support, uh, along along with I guess everyone else's support, as it would as it would happen. Uh, but anyway, Walker's the the current governor of Wisconsin. I believe he took office in 2011. Uh, the guy on the right is Tom Barrett, uh, former mayor of Milwaukee. I believe I don't know if he's still the mayor or not. Uh, but anyway, speaking of Walker, when he takes office, uh, he starts off uh, with one of his major legislative. Uh, items on the agenda to sort of reduce the collective bargaining rights of state workers. Uh, so people who are working for the government, basically, uh, he doesn't want them to have the right uh, uh, to bargain as effectively, basically, you know, and, and the ultimate effect of this is down, down the road, they're not going to have as much compensation in terms of like pensions or, or probably wages or things like that. Uh, this is a way for, for Walker, uh, who's a Republican. Uh, to, to try to reduce spending at the state level. Uh, naturally, though, this upsets people who are more sympathetic to workers' rights, who don't want to reduce collective bargaining for people, uh, and it upsets them to the degree that they start to initiate recall proceedings against Walker. In the case of Wisconsin, I believe it was like 900,000 signatures that they needed uh, to start the recall election, uh, which they succeed in. And after that point, uh, Wisconsin begins its own recall election. In this case, though, you, you notice the ballot is considerably simpler than it was in California. Uh, that's just because uh, in this election, you know, the, the procedures for recall elections are determined in each state. And in Wisconsin, uh, they basically operated the recall election uh, 
the same as any normal governor's election. Uh, so the Republicans had their nominee, Scott Walker. The Democrats held a primary election to determine who was going to go up against Walker in the recall election. They selected Tom Barrett, uh, who actually was the guy that Walker defeated in the previous uh, election, but they decided to go with him again in the recall election. Uh, and then you just had uh, these two candidates along with an independent on the ballot uh, in a write-in slot. Much simpler decision here. You didn't have the, the first phase of should we recall them or should we not, and then a list of a, a ton of candidates. It's just uh, the Republican and the Democrat. Uh, and mostly, most of the people are just going to be choosing between those two. Uh, as a, In opposition to the California uh, recall, though, Walker, the incumbent, survives this election uh, fairly comfortably. Uh, it wasn't uh, a blowout or anything, but it was by, I think, about five points that he survives the recall election uh, to stay in office. And speaking throughout history, just to give this some historical context, there have only, only been three total recall elections for governors in the history of the country. Um, one in the early 19, uh, I think the 1920s, in which uh, the governors are moved, the, the California case we just discussed in which the governors are moved, uh, and then here in Wisconsin, which is actually the first time that a sitting governor has survived a recall election. Uh, so that's just an interesting bit of historical context uh, for the, the elections we're talking about. Okay, so that is the end of this lecture on federalism. I will see you next time.